uh, as you know, the Dakota is an old aircraft, and uh, we could not fly above the mountain. So we flew along the valleys, and we had to follow the valleys. Just go through, clear take off, left hand. Take off, left. Hello and welcome to the Blue Skies Podcast. I'm PR Ganapati, your host. Well, folks, in this episode, we have a pilot who has a slightly different but very, very interesting profile. Wing Commander Joseph Thomas was commissioned in 1962 on the eve of the Chinese operations into the transport stream of the Indian Air Force. He flew Dakotas, servicing uh, the logistics supply to our forward positions in Cargill, Leh, Thois, and Dollar Bay Godi in the Dakota and the Packet and also flew many sorties of photo reconnaissance in the Canberra. He then qualified as a test pilot at that famous mecca of test flying, the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base. Came back to India and as a test pilot, uh, besides doing test flying, also set up India's first test pilot school and conducted some of those courses then. Commanded the flight test squadron and We'll also be speaking to him about his very interesting experiences, including some mishaps as a test pilot. Welcome to the program, Wing Commander Thomas. Yeah, thank you. So uh, if we can start with your career journey, where did you grow up and what uh, motivated you to join the Air Force? And what was that initial journey like? Uh, well, uh, my father joined the Air Force in 1939. And uh, so I grew up in the Air Force. And my father records that when I was three years old, I asked him a question. How does such a big and heavy uh, airplane like the Dakota fly? So I suppose my interest in aviation goes back to childhood. Fascinating. And it's not just uh, interest in aviation, but it's also the how of aviation, the, the engineering and the science behind it, I guess. Yeah, that is true because uh, I, I was a good student at school and I did set a school record and things like that. And I was al- always interested in the how. And uh, if I had not uh, joined the Air Force, uh, I would have gone in for science or engineering. Yeah, in my school, I joined the NCC Air Wing, uh, Junior Air Wing, and uh, so I did something there in um, aero modeling and uh, things like that, and uh, some NCC camps. Uh, so there was always an interest in uh, aviation, and uh, I applied for NDA while I was in my final year at school and I got selected. So I j- joined the National Defense Academy. And uh, the main reason I joined the NDA is that uh, I would have been underage to uh, try a direct entry to the Air Force. Right. And which aircraft did you train in and where did you do your initial training? In NDA, we had uh, gliding and that is very important because uh, well, every airplane can become a glider. And uh, so that is very basic. That's right. And um, then after that, uh, after NDA, we went to the Air Force Flying College. Then at Jodhpur, I trained on the HT2 and the P6G uh, Harvard. 
and after that, uh, then to Air Force Station Hyderabad, where I trained on the C-47 Dakota. Ah, wow. That's fascinating. That's uh, such a lovely aircraft, and the Air Force has now just acquired a, an aircraft for the vintage flight, right? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, actually, when I was in NDA, the Hunters and Canberras had just joined the Air Force and uh, they were based at Pune. And uh, right from that time, I was interested in getting on to Canberras. And um, there are two routes to the Canberra, either through fighters or through transport. And um, I did opt for fighters, but um, uh, the training command sent me to transports. But uh, Ultimately, it didn't make a difference because it did land up in Canberra. Right. Which squadrons and what sort of flying did you do initially in the Dakota fleet? Where were you posted and what sort of missions were you typically flying? Yeah, my first posting was to a Dakota squadron in uh, Srinagar. Actually, we were in Srinagar in summer and uh, uh, Jammu in winter. And we flew... Mm -hmm. uh, airlift missions and supply dropping missions to Ladakh, uh, Leh, Hoyce, Kargil, and uh, supply dropping at places like uh, Sultan Chishku and uh, uh, Murgo, which are on the Shiok uh, Valley. And uh, those two supply dropping zones are, in fact, very close to where the uh, Galwan incident took place last year. Oh, that's fascinating. And Describe a you know a typical day in the in the squadron life. What was your uh, how many sorties would you fly? How many hours would you fly? What would the weather be like? Uh, and what were some of the unique challenges of operating and flying the Dakota in that mission and that role in that region? Well, the first thing is that uh, there was no typical day, and um, <laughs> I got a lesson uh, in. Uh, uh, well, in my daily routine right there, because um, there was an operational requirement and, uh, you know, the border was started heating up in 1959-60 and I joined in uh, July 62. Uh, okay, so any day whether, when the weather was good, we flew, whether that was Sunday or holiday or whatever. And uh, if the weather was bad, then we got a holiday. If the weather was marginal, then we came early morning and uh, well, then the uh, senior people took a decision whether we would fly or not. Okay, so there were no, every day was a working day or every day was a holiday, whichever way you looked at it. And I looked at it as right. a holiday because uh, well, you got to fly in the mountains and uh, there was nothing like it. So uh, it was great. We came early morning and uh, we got uh, on a good weather day. We got airborne uh, just before sunrise. So it was great to see the sunrise uh, over the mountains. And uh, then, as you know, the, uh, as you know, the Dakota is an old aircraft and uh, we could not fly above the mountains. So we flew along the valleys and we had to follow the valleys. And we kept to the right so that returning traffic also kept to the right so that we, and there was also a little bit of height separation and all that. So that was interesting. We saw Fascinating. Beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, peaks like Nunkun and, uh, uh, you know, uh, then uh, we had nicknames for some of those uh, places, Dras, Kargil, Suru, Valley. Uh, then Indus Valley, uh, Lake, and the first airfield was Kargil. Kargil is very interesting because it's in a bowl and uh, you were really doing a very a tight circuit uh, in that bowl. Lay was uh, easier, open, more open ground. And uh, Toys was on a, really on the side of a riverbed. It was a dirt airfield. And we had to climb to 20,000 mm -hmm. to cross that. Uh, our Dakotas oh, were modified for high altitude. We had uh, 
mm-hmm. two speed superchargers which could uh, take us to altitude and uh, we were breathing uh, oxygen uh, any passengers mm-hmm. we had uh, really had a tough time because we went up to 17000 feet uh, to go to lay and uh, they didn't have oxygen uh, when we did supply ah. dropping the ejection crew really had a tough time normally uh, there were four ejection crew from the army we gave them portable oxygen bottles mm. but you know in the dakota when you mm. do supply drop in you remove that uh, door so as it is on the right. aircraft and it is cold out there yeah uh, so we would keep them in the crew cabin which is little warmer but during the actual ejection they had to go out there and uh, uh, that was really a tough job they would uh, you know take a puff of oxygen throughout the load take another puff of oxygen and by the time we finish the drop they would be frozen solid and we would get them into the crew cabin to warm up so this should be a little bit of a tribute uh, to the army ejection crew who worked with us now ah oh, that is just an amazing uh, i cannot imagine how difficult that must have been yeah uh, but it was interesting and i mean it's really more like uh, adventure sports you know uh, as long as uh, i mean that was the attitude and uh, um, you know one of the interesting things was uh, you know when you're flying in a valley and uh, if there was an overcast sky then you were really Uh, like flying through a tunnel because you had the ground below the mountains mm-hmm. on either side and the clouds above so that was really great and you really had to know the valley you better not get into a wrong valley and a dead end uh, one or two people have done that uh, but, um, you had to be careful and you should know the place like the back of your hand even now i uh, remember all the places in uh, <laughs> and uh, ladakh you ask me some village i'll tell you <laughs> where it is right. uh, anyway. <laughs> and the and the dakota used to be operated by a crew of how many people you have two pilots navigator and engineer no the full crew is two pilots a navigator and a signaler signaler okay yeah uh, because uh, we had to operate uh, wt or uh, uh, wireless you know most cold and all mm-hmm. in those days uh, to communicate wow. with the uh, base so a signaler was uh, important now navigator was required but um, we were a short of crew you know because the uh, air force expanded uh, during that uh, time and uh, we mm-hmm. were short of people so there were occasions when we were short of pilots and a navigator would uh, Uh, sit in as the co-pilot and uh, there were mm. times when we flew without a navigator and the pilots uh, did the map reading basically it was all uh, you know visual flying and uh, map reading and uh, no uh, none of that um, charts and things like that uh, so mm-hmm. three to four crew and for supply dropping we had four uh, army ejection crew so that mm-hmm. was the uh crew status um, okay so and in terms of you know payload and and performance were you operating fairly close to the margin of the envelope for the aircraft oh well we were not close to the margin we were at the margin and uh, <laughs> because uh, you know uh, you land at kargil which is more than 9000 feet high lay which is more than 10000 feet high and um, Uh, with a full load uh, on the aircraft and uh, then you have to take off from there no so you're taking off at right. 10000 feet uh, in a piston engine uh, aircraft and uh, for oh, this, uh, whether all the airfields after take off we used to do uh, a climbing turn you know orbiting the airfield a little bit so that you could clear mm-hmm. the mountains when you go uh, but i must say the right. the quota is uh, uh, very good aircraft much superior to the il 14 that uh, squadron we had next door and uh, mm-hmm. better high altitude performance than uh, 
the packet. We had uh, three squadrons left. Right. Packet one, I fourteen, and one packet one squadron. So in terms of high altitude performance, we were the best out of the three, and uh, mm -hmm. we were the only people flying to Kargil and Thois at that time. And there was only one road to Ladakh that went through Zojila, and Zojila gets mm -hmm. sixty feet of snow in winter. So Zojila right. used to be closed up, uh, let us say, from November to uh, May. Uh, so mm -hmm. air was the only communication uh, between uh, uh, the Kashmir Valley and uh, Ladakh, and the AN twelves would fly in from Chandigarh. So mm -hmm. AN 12s from Chandigarh and us from Srinagar Jammu were the only communication, and. Two airfields, Kargil and Le, and sorry, Kargil and Thois, we were the only people operating. Uh, you know, it, um, Thois was a dirt runway, the others couldn't land there. Only Dakota could operate there, or uh, uh, the very few helicopters we had also at that time. So wow. uh, the army people there uh, were really, you know, uh, Hundred percent dependent on us in uh, winter, and uh, mm -hmm. to a large extent dependent on us in uh, summer. So that was right. uh, uh, very good experience. And the thing was that very soon, within a week or ten days after I reached there, we had the Galwan incident of 1962, where a Gurkha, of 62, right? Yeah, a Gurkha uh, post, platoon post in. Uh, the Galwan River Valley was surrounded by the mm -hmm. Chinese, and there was a standoff. Yes, and mm -hmm. uh, a helicopter, uh, one of our helicopters flew there, and then it had uh, an engine failure due to fuel blockage, force landed mm -hmm. there, and uh, we had a very good uh, pilot there, Tido Narayanan, and uh, he right. opened out the fuel filter, cleaned it, put it back. And because their fuel used to be uh, contaminated uh, with all sorts of things because they were uh, getting fuel from barrels, you know, and all the rough right. things. Used. So he cleaned the fuel filter <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, the local Chinese, uh, they were flummoxed. So they took off again. <laughs> no, they mm. didn't have orders, so they did not fire. Uh, and uh, oh, wow. took off again, he managed to fly into our territory and uh, force land the second time because the, by then the fuel fil filter had got clogged again. So that was the Gilgong incident. Right. incident and uh, mm. the Chinese protested for violation of their airspace. And we replied that uh, we reserve the right to fly over our own territory. So that was a confrontation, right. confrontation in early October. And before that, on the 8th of September, we had the Chinese uh, uh, attack at Bagla Ridge in the northeast eastern sector. And right. uh, three of our aeroplanes were sent there because uh, we had the two-speed supercharger and could operate at high altitudes. The Dakotas there uh -huh. operate at the high altitude that we could operate. So, Mm -hmm. Our squadron really took part in the 62 war, both on uh, the Ladakh sector and the Nifa sector. I think we have one of the few units can, they can claim that uh, uh, privilege or honor or whatever you like. So from September, it had hotted up and um, uh, we were really quite uh, expecting a, a Chinese attack. But um, the higher ups in Delhi, uh, they had a different view anyway. And, uh, you know, all the reports speak of uh, our being surprised when the Chinese attacked. But we in the field were not surprised I mean, because the tension had uh, built up and uh, we were expecting an attack any day. Fascinating. We, yeah, the Chinese attack took place on the 20th of October. And... Uh, uh, I was uh, with flight lift from Chengapal doing a supply dropping sortie at uh, Sultan Chushku. 
and mm-hmm. and A and twelve uh, captained by squad leader then uh, then squad leader later Air Marshal Chandan Singh was fired upon by the mm-hmm. Chinese early morning, and obviously he radioed back, and that was the first intimation that uh, you know the authorities in Delhi came to know of the uh, Chinese attack in this sector, the northeast of Kota. Wow. They, and they fired on him with small arms, or was they? Did they have anti-aircraft weapons? No, small arms. He was doing a supply drop, mm-hmm. and he did get a few bullet holes here and there. Uh, right. But, um, I mean, um, no, uh, there was no sort of. Uh, I mean, it was uh, hit on the aircraft, but nothing vital was damaged. And uh, nothing vital. Yeah, he flew back. Uh, we were all recalled, but uh, we decided to complete the drop. We completed the drop and then went back. So that was the 20th of October, and uh, so the uh, firing started and the balloon was up. So at that time, was DBO active as a landing ground? Were you all operating oh, yes, the DBO? Yes, uh, that was a show. Uh, well, we were on one side of the runway. I mean, in tents and all that. And the packet mm-hmm. squadron was on the other side of the runway. And um, as I told you, the packets did not have a good high altitude uh, performance. And uh, mm-hmm. about two years before I joined, uh, you know, they had a large number of uh, engine failures all successfully handled. But, uh, you know, mm-hmm. it was really very difficult because if a packet had an engine failure, he was continuously descending, so then you're following the valley, descending and uh, coming and land. All, all of them were successfully handled, but uh, that is mm-hmm. when uh, uh, people decided to fit a jet engine on the aircraft. Mm-hmm. So initially they fitted a J-34 uh, uh, Stuart Davis uh, engine, and uh, the modification was done in HL, and uh, right. the Project pilot was uh, then uh, flight lieutenant uh, Philippos, and uh, then they brought the aircraft to uh, Srinagar. And in July '62, the first landing was done at uh, DBO, 16,700 feet. Uh, then Skolder Rajay was the uh, first pilot. Yeah. And, uh, later, I marshal. Uh, later, I marshal, and uh, ABM Pinto was CMC. Uh, operational command, uh, he flew as the co-pilot and they also had uh, Light Life and Philippos on board. And uh, mm-hmm. the tension and the, you know, all the border heating up was so much that normally for a trial landing, you will go with a light all-up weight, an empty aircraft. But that right. first flight uh, took a full load of uh, Army Jawans uh, to beef up the post in uh, DBO. Oh and, my goodness, wow. Yeah, and subsequently we, they did more sorties. Uh, in fact, um, you know, a Shaktiman truck with the superstructure removed could fit into a packet. So they have taken even... A, <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah, they've taken even a Shaktiman truck to uh, DBO. And the packet had a, a rear loading ramp, wasn't it? It, it had a rear loading ramp and... Uh, uh, it had a very poor high altitude performance. You know, it's a very fat, ugly aircraft. But it yes. has a huge uh, 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 cargo bay cross section. Mm-hmm. As I said, it took a Shaktiman truck uh, without the superstructure, but the basic truck. And uh, uh, a packet could also take a complete uh, NAT aircraft. You know, the wing would be taken off the NAT aircraft. And uh, wow. diagonally in that cargo bay, and the fuselage, of course, is very little put in. So a complete night aircraft could go in the uh, packet, and even a Canberra fuselage, except the low section, the basic fuselage, would go in a, a packet. So you know, packets have wow. have ferried. Uh, I would packets. never have thought that. <laughs> 
It also had a beautiful uh, cockpit, I'm told. Really large, big windows, beautiful views. Yeah, it had a big uh, uh, cockpit and all that. I, I had the good fortune or the misfortune, as you call, may call it, of flying the packet later. Uh, very big cockpit uh, with uh, five crew members. The only transport aircraft I know of where the crew and the passengers had to carry parachutes. So, oh, really? <laughs> was, uh, quite an experience. Anyway, it had, uh, it used to make all sorts of uh, noises and uh, all sorts of things. <laughs> anyway, that was <laughs> But with the jetpack, was it uh, fairly efficient uh, operating at altitude, getting into and out of DBO? Yeah, yeah, correct. Uh, with the jetpack, it would zoom up and, uh, you know, it could uh, maintain height uh, in case of one, uh, one engine failure, because then you had two engines, uh, you know, suppose a piston failed, then you had a, one piston and one jet, and the jet was in the center on top, so there was no asymmetric uh, issue on that. So the jetpack was on good. Top, uh, right. And that was only used for takeoff and, and in... Uh... Uh, it was used for takeoff and for climb. And um, it was uh, kept at uh, idling for uh, the circuit and landing. You know, landing at the forward base. Uh, now, okay, uh, so in case you needed it for going around. Uh... You could uh, use it. And the thing is that um, very few were modified. So throughout only the squadron, which was operating in uh, Kashmir, uh, Ladakh, uh, had the jetpack. The uh, squadron, uh, also the paratroopers training school who were in uh, the planes, they did not have it. And uh, so mm -hmm. that was uh, the thing. And um, it was good, it was a good modification. And uh, it served us well. And it did make a difference yeah. in... Uh, flying for in the high altitude at... Uh, and so for how many years did you uh, operate uh, in this sort of uh, logistics transport role to the high altitude locations? Yeah, okay. In my first uh, two years of service, I had three postings. I served for one year <laughs> in Kashmir. Then they posted me to Peace Station, uh, Paratroopers Training School in Agra. But uh, mm -hmm. I really fretted over there and I was wasting my time. Uh, the son who <laughs> in uh, headquarters and um, so made a fuss. And after six months, I was posted back to Srinagar. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, I got to fly there for some more time. Uh, then um, they posted me to Agra to do a packet conversion. The idea was that mm -hmm. uh, I would do packet conversion, two, three of us, and get a little experience and then operate in packets in uh, Kashmir. But uh, mm -hmm. things turned out otherwise because uh, I was flying packets. Uh, there was a signal from air headquarters asking were anybody interested in moving on to Canberra, so I immediately gave my name. <laughs> Uh, yeah, long dream came true. Yeah, and uh, so I moved across uh, in, to Jet Bomber Conversion Unit. JBCU. JBCU, that was in uh, January 66. Uh, wow. So, How many hours did you have by that time, if you can remember? Oh, I had about um, more than 2,000 hours. Because, uh, you know, in JNK, we uh -huh. were flying uh, day in, day out. In fact, during the Chinese ops, uh, uh, we were flying every day. And fortunately, the weather was good. So mm -hmm. at that time, we flew so much that uh, I really felt uh, I'd become a bird. You know? yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, I mean, it was uh, operations. Right. So, I had uh, 1,000 hours by before I completed one year service. And, uh, Fascinating. About 2,000 hours by the time I went on campus. Okay.
So tell me about the Canberra, what was uh, it designed for, what did we procure it for, and then what were your first impressions and experiences flying the Canberra? Yeah, the Canberra uh, is quite a unique aircraft. Uh, it was, the design was done in 1945, and it was a jet successor to the Mosquito. Now, the Mosquito is a twin-engine fighter, bomber, and reconnaissance aircraft. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, it was mostly used for bombing and reconnaissance, but also used as a night fighter. And if you see the statistics, the bomb, uh, the Mosquito uh, shot down a whole lot of uh, aircraft as a fighter, but it's not uh, remembered much as a fighter. So the Canberra was designed as a replacement for the Mosquito. And it is a very worthy replacement. The design started in 1945, and it first flew in 1949. And uh, it was really a sensation because uh, it could uh, outfly any fighter of the day, especially in terms of mm -hmm. especially in terms of altitude performance. And uh, right. uh, it was. For a few years, it was unchallenged in the sky. Then, of course, uh, the fighters, uh, Hunter could just about uh, uh, match it at uh, the higher altitudes. And um, in fact, uh, in the early 50s, now things have been unclassified. The British flew a lot of uh, reconnaissance sorties over the Soviet Union using the Canberra, and it set altitude records, and it had a mm. distinction. It took part in a bomber competition in USA, and um, the performance was so good that um, the American US Air Force bought it. They did modify it here and there, and uh, they manufactured it under license. Right. So, uh, <laughs> really. Uh, after we bought the Canberra, the uh, Pakistanis bought or they given aid, whichever uh, we look at it, they got the American version of the Canberra. So in the 65 and 71 wars, uh, both sides had the Canberra. So that was... Right. <laughs> uh, but there's no, been no encounter between uh, two Canberras. Most of the attacks in 65 and 71 were at uh, night. Uh, okay, so the Canberra is a highly maneuverable aircraft. It is initially designed as a high altitude uh, bomber. And uh, later on, as the initially it had uh, tremendous superiority over the fighters of the day because it could fly higher and uh, the fighters could not uh, catch it. Then, as the fighters improved, and then you had the uh, supersonic aircraft like the F-104 and MiG-21 and all that, uh, that superiority was lost and radars also improved. And uh, then mm -hmm. we started using it for low level. But there's a big disadvantage in low level because your radius of action is reduced to one third because the right. aircraft is designed for high altitude to the pure jet. Uh, but then that yeah. is part of it. And uh, in 62, we did move one squadron uh, towards the east, but then, you know, the war stopped in four, uh, four weeks. In 65, we used it and low level uh, bombing. And um, really, one of the most difficult things that we did in Canberra's was night low level because there was no aids in it was map reading with the navigator wow. and the pilot. And um, mm -hmm. when you were new and inexperienced, it was uh, when you flew on moonlit nights, but then as you got experience, you went on to dark night. So dark night low level on the Canberra is probably the most uh, difficult uh, 
operational exercise and being through. And let us because at night, no level, dark night, uh, you, you can't see the ground and you can't see any hills and your uh, navigation has to be very accurate so that you don't pop up into a hill. And you didn't have a, you didn't have a radar altimeter or anything else? No, the radar altimeter we had was That's what I presume with those World days. War One, with uh, the frequency modulated thing, which was basically useless, and we just uh, uh, couldn't uh, uh, use it. We couldn't rely on it, so you, you just uh, we really fo uh, had to forget about it. Uh, we were the first aircraft in this part of the world to have a Doppler, and, and which is linked to the. Uh, the gyro compass. So you had a Doppler, which could give you ground speed and drift. And since it was linked, uh, there was an analog uh, computer and all that, and you could get ground position. But this worked in the early days, and it was good for high level because it really did work uh, below about thousand feet. So when you were at low level, it wasn't all that uh, uh, all that good. Mm -hmm. And as the aircraft got older and, uh, well, in those days, uh, India was far more bureaucratic than what we were now. And, well, basically, it was, uh, the country was controlled by clerical level people. And the clerical level people would keep a tight control over petty cash and uh, waste uh, right. you know, right. money. So, you ran out of spares for very small things. And um, well, when it worked, that Doppler and ground uh, position indicator was good, but uh, very often didn't work. So, I mean, uh, things have changed. I mean, mm -hmm. of today is quite right. different. Of that uh, time, it's difficult for uh, the current generation to really imagine how things were uh, 50, 60 years back. Right. So what was your experience uh, operating the Canberra in a bomber role? And, you know, how accurate was it as a, as a platform for delivering weapons or bombs on target? And what were some of your experiences operating it like that? Yeah, firstly, my bomber experience was limited because uh, by the time I got I spent about a year in the bomber squadron. My mm -hmm. old instructor in the ABCU had become a flight commander in the photo squadron. And uh, he um, got me posted uh, to the uh, photo squadron. So I spent most of my uh, flying in the photo squadron. As far as bomber, okay. mm -hmm. uh, no, I, uh, I mean, I don't have operational experience on the bomber. Of course, uh, practice and training was there. In terms of accuracy, uh, we had a bombing computer which helped, but what it helped was to do the bombing calculation for the visual bombing. So from high level, I would estimate that, uh, you know, you could land a bomb within about 100 yards. And there was also mm -hmm. a scheme of uh, uh, what was called blue study, you know, two uh, beams would, uh, you know, from two different ground stations would intersect and give mm -hmm. uh, over the target, all that was calculated and all that. And uh, so that would allow you to bomb at high level uh, over clouds or anything like that, because if there were clouds below, visual bombing didn't work. So that also gave about the same accuracy. Uh, but mm -hmm. the technique that we had developed was to fly in at low level and then just before the target, zoom up to avoid the ACAC fire from the ground. So that was right. very successful. And in 65 war, uh, not a single Canberra was shot down uh, while using that technique. But uh, one Canberra was shot down in 65, but that was because, uh, uh, you know, somewhere down the line, people had got overconfident and decided to uh, 
try out this um, this beam type of bombing at uh, uh, medium altitude. So I think you were shot down at 15 or 20,000 feet. But all the aircraft that went in low level and zoomed up, they were not uh, shot down. So 65, except for that, we, we had zero uh, losses. And uh, so now the thing about visual bombing is that the lower that you are, the more accurate it is. So uh, the Canberra bomber raids of 65 have been uh, written about all over. So, I mean, and, and there are even YouTube videos about it. So those who are interested can read about it. And the Canberra was also fitted for ground attack. You could have a gun pod with four cannon with 2,000 rounds. It's much more than a fighter. And also carry rockets on the uh, underwing. So, oh wow! People must have read about the uh, raid on Badin uh, radar station by then uh, Wing Commander Pete Wilson and uh, Skolander Shankaran. Wing Commander later, uh, Commander Wilson was a very modest person, and he never, you know, talked much about it or anything like that, and. Uh, uh, but what happened was that Pakistan radio announced it and uh, said one aircraft came sneaking it and 50 feet and fired rockets at the radar and all that. <laughs> so that caught attention in Delhi and uh, they awarded him a Veer Chakra. So really, uh, I would say that his uh, citation was uh, by the Pakistanis. So what the was... photo reconnaissance Canberra, the PR Canberra, that was a special aircraft that was specially ordered or was existing Canberra modified for that particular role? No, it's a completely different, uh, I mean, the basic airframe is the same. And the many versions of the Canberra, you know, started with the B2, then, uh, then they had the PR version, PR3, trainer, uh, you know, all, all that uh, sort of thing. So what we had was the export version of the B8, called B58 in India for the bomber. And we had the PR7 uh, export version, you know, slight modifications uh, for us. Uh, so that is a PR57. Okay. Now, uh -huh. uh, the basic airframe and the engines were the same. The layout is completely different. And because, you know, there were no bombs required. Uh, the part of the bomb bay was converted into a fuel tank. Uh, other part of the Bombay could, uh, had, um, could carry flares for uh, dropping at night and then night photography, which uh, didn't really work. So uh, we were entirely on day photography. So really our payload was basically, you know, a camera, which uh, you know doesn't compare with uh, uh, bombs in terms of weight. So we had uh, mm -hmm. uh, 4,000 pounds of, of fuel more than the bomber. What was the endurance of the bomber and how much was that increased because of these 4,000 pounds? Oh, I would say that at high level, a bomber could fly maybe four, four and a half hours, but we could fly six hours with reserve. Uh, but wow, fascinating. Then at the end, uh, you were climbing to 48,000 feet because by the time your fuel load was low, you could go up to 48,000 feet. Uh, you could go higher, but uh, 48,000 was the limit because of uh, oxygen. Above that, you would require uh, a you pressure suit. a pressure suit. Not a pressure suit. Okay. There's a slightly intermediate uh, zone between about uh, 48 and 55,000 feet where you can manage with, uh, with pressure breathing. A uh, jacket which puts pressure on your chest. Uh, but uh, not really, but when you get to aircraft like the U-2 and SR-71, they all have pressure suit. And apparently mm -hmm. in yeah. Indian in the early days, all the big 21 sorties were with pressure suit. And so what was the uh, PR Canberra used for? What sort of missions did you fly? In peacetime, our mission was uh, uh, training and uh, survey. And in operations, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we were on reconnaissance. Now, uh, in peacetime, when you did a survey, 
uh, we covered the whole country. We were the first uh, uh, first country in you know this part of the world to use jet aircraft for uh, survey and all that. In fact, uh, we surveyed the India Tibet border good uh, at least twenty years before the, our neighbors did it because uh, they didn't have anything to, wow. uh, uh, to that. Uh, you know, we were far more advanced. In fact, I would like to point out that um, in 1947, uh, Japan and India were the only two countries with uh, an aircraft industry. 1948, we got the Vampire, and we were the first uh, Air Force in Asia to have jet aircraft. Uh, so, you know, in those wow. days, we were uh, quite on top of the world. <laughs> Uh, in, some respects, in some respects, not. But anyway, uh, things have uh, changed. Uh, so in peacetime, we did a survey. Now, the thing is that um, prior to this, all the survey in India was done by ground survey. And uh, so, so in uh, somewhere around 1951, 52, uh, we found a survey flight in uh, Barakpur, Calcutta, uh, which had uh, Dakota, Devon, and a uh, freighter version of the Liberator. And uh, it was wow. It was this survey flight which uh, did that famous photograph of uh, Mount Everest in 1953. So for those aircraft to climb to 30,000 feet was a great achievement. Uh, so they My did a fair amount of survey. Uh, then when the Canberra came, then uh, peacetime we were busy with uh, a survey. And uh, very soon we covered the whole country and uh, mm -hmm. good up-to-date uh, maps uh, became available. And their uh, uh, survey of India, I would say, is on par with uh, all the advanced countries. And um, so by the time we surveyed the country, uh, our maps were made up to date, up to world standards. Um, then, of course, areas had to be uh, covered uh, again. The most difficult, of course, was in the Himalayas because large portions of the Himalayas were just blank on the map. You know, in an atlas or something, they they just fill in the gaps. But when you go to a detailed map, which the army has to use, they were just blank right. spaces. They, they either blank spaces on the map or uh, not proper, you know, unsurveyed. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in maps, uh, you have contour lines, but where you're not sure, the contour lines are marked in dotted lines. So really when wow. you had to first... Uh, to the border, and uh, you know, the border basically covers the uh, the crest line, the highest uh, points. Uh, we found the maps were so inaccurate. So what we did was we climbed to forty five thousand feet and took uh, photographs. Now for mapping, uh, you need to get stereoscopic images. So each right. photograph, each point on the ground has to be photographed twice from two different places so that you can do stereoscoping. Uh, so you need minimum 50% overlap, but to cater for variations in ground height and things like that, 60% so was the norm. Uh, so we flew a series of parallel runs, then took those photographs and uh, you know, when you put them together, you know, you sort of stitch the photographs together, you get a mosaic. And this was all done mechanically, I presume, at that time. In those days, films were processed, you know, you had the black and white films and all that, which were processed. Uh, and all that. Uh, and uh, then we used that, those photographs to further fly. And that is quite difficult because the photographs were black and white. You know, we don't realize the importance of color in a map. You know, like roads are normally red and 
railway lines on the right. north and uh, rivers and streams, water features are blue. So the moment you see blue, you know it's a water feature. But when the whole thing is in black and white, it's, um, uh, you know, it's quite difficult. And uh, a map is far better for map reading than a photograph. Because in a map, what happens is right. you draw a thick line for a big road. The actual, so when you go on an aeronautical map, the actual thickness of a highway is, a, if you really take the scale, it, uh, what is shown on the map is about a kilometer wide. No, no <laughs> kilometer wide. Right. But right. It, right. it allows you to look for a road, it allows you to look for a stream. But in a photograph, yes. there's uh, the correct uh, width. So, uh, we, did right. and, uh, uh, we were able to fill in all the blanks. Most of the old maps were based on, uh, I mean, I'm talking of the difficult areas in Arunachal Pradesh and, uh, you know, the Northeast uh, Manipur, Mizoram and all that. We're based on travelers' reports and things like that. And a fair amount of uh, uh, updation and correction of the maps uh, was uh, done by us. Wonderful. I'll attach a link to your very detailed interview that you gave with BIC Talk so that uh, anybody in the audience is interested in that, some more can also take a look at that. Well, folks, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. I pick up the threads again next week with Wing Commander Thomas and speak about his test flying career. There are a few things during today's conversation that were really very interesting to me. The first was just to hear about the dedication with which the Dakota and Packet and IL-14 pilots used to fly their missions to supply the army, particularly in bad weather and winter, flying through those valleys with an aircraft that was at the margin of its performance and doing that day in and day out because they knew the army counted on them. I think that's the sort of camaraderie that you see in the armed forces, which is just wonderful to behold. The second was the fascinating use of the PR Canberra and how today so many of our maps are really drawn by the hard work that was done by these folks manually uh, taking photographs and then processing that information and creating the maps that we all take for granted today. The third is the uh, the jugard that was uh, all pervasive at that time, you know, putting a jetpack on the uh, on the packet is quite a mind blowing exercise. And if you Google it, you'll see pictures of the uh, aircraft with the jetpack. But these were not uh, ad hoc jugard. This was systematic jugard in the sense there was a problem. They analyzed various solutions, developed a proper engineering solution, tested it thoroughly and rigorously before they implemented it in the field and there was a healthy culture of doing that throughout the Air Force. I mentioned that uh, Wing Commander Thomas has done a detailed talk on surveying using the Canberra and the link for that is BIC Talks. So if you search for BIC Talks, you should be able to find that podcast. It's also on YouTube and it does make for some really fascinating listening. In the meantime, sign up for updates at blueskiespodcast.com. There you'll find links to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also write to us with your comments, questions, suggestions, and feedback from the website or to blueskies at prganapati.com. Subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting platform such as Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and even on YouTube. If you like what you heard, Share it with your friends, give us a rating in your favorite podcasting app, and write us a review. It will help other people find us. I want to give my thanks to Saurav Chaudhya for our logo and Prithvik for the music. I want to reiterate that all the views expressed here are personal, and this podcast has not been approved by or reviewed by the Air Force, Ministry of Defense, or any branch of the government. In the meantime, stay safe. And Jay Hind.